Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So today I'm going to talk about EdgeX, and it's the action at the edge. OK, so let's see. So we're going to cover Industry 4.0 and Edge. Maybe nobody in this, need, in this room needs to know about it. Everyone here knows about Edge and IoT and Industry 4.0. But I do like those two slides, so we share them. Then we talk about EdgeX and what does EdgeX 1.0 have in it and what's coming beyond. So briefly, we are at the lucky point in life where there's Industry 4.0. This digital world has spanned everywhere, anywhere, and it's getting faster and faster, and it's going to enrich our lives so phenomenally. Uh, back when I started, in computer science and was doing my PhD, AI was something I was very, very interested in, but the time hadn't come. You know, computing wasn't ubiquitous, it wasn't cheap, there wasn't a cloud out there. Uh, my little TI Explorer used to you know, struggle and it would get hot and things like that. So things have come a long way and it's come even further from the 15 years back when I used to work on IoT and edge and embedded systems when it was not sexy. So today is a very special day, and that's why I like that Industry 4.0 slide. Earlier this morning, during the keynotes, we heard Arpreet talk about all the different possible applications. And they're trying to come up with a glossary of what an edge is and the size of the edges. And I'm going to say I don't care. An edge is an edge. It can be a little edge, you know, just a little water molecule kind of thing. It can be a whole drop of water. It can be a bigger drop, like a raindrop, or it can be a mighty cloud. So for me, the edge is something distant from your data center, but something very close to the source of data. You're going to process your data right where it's created, so you don't have response latencies that are large. You don't need a lot of network bandwidth to transmit it somewhere, but you have your smarts where you need it. And, and we're actually in an age and space where there's going to be a data deluge, and you don't want to really be transmitting every boring thing you're doing up or seeing or hearing into a cloud for processing and storage. And, and we heard another talk this morning at the keynote about how data centers are you know, competing with the airline industry for their carbon footprint. You know, I'm, I'm bigger, I'm wider, I'm going to heat up the planet faster type of thing. So some of this is also going to relieve that by not having to transmit so much data, by processing it sooner, by not having to store everything and making some kind of storage arrays that are taller than Mount Everest. So the edge will depend on the application, the compute that it has, the hardware acceleration it has, et cetera, et cetera, for the problem. So that's why the edge is important, because we want to do stuff close to where the data is and all the other good stuff it brings, like reducing response latency, network bandwidth, and also preserving privacy. OK, so this brings us to what is edgex. And I wanted to start out by saying what it is and what it is not. And on day one of our keynotes, we were talking about mascots and whether they're cute or cuddly. And, and EdgeX has a cute mascot. It's this octopus, beautiful purple. We can't touch it, so we can't know if it's slimy. So let's assume it's a nice, soft, cuddly, happy octopus. But it also says something about the octopus's arms. They have intelligence at their edge. It's not like there's only a central brain that does a lot of things, and that's the sort of stuff we wanted to carry over when we were talking about IoT and Edge, that there is intelligence at those pods and those little sucker points all across your network where those you know, Edge resources lie, where those sensors lie, et cetera. So let's see what EdgeX is. It's open source. It's part of the Linux Foundation. It's part of the LF Edge umbrella. It's been there for over a year now, and it's picked up momentum, picked up more people, more developers. It provides data ingestion. It can do some amount of store and forward. It can forward everything. It can store a lot. It can process it. It can chew it up and throw it out, or it can export it to any different cloud endpoint of yours. 
It provides multi-protocol connectivity, and we'll come to that in a little bit, like the different protocols. It's extensible, it's customizable, so you can add different profiles for different kinds of sensors. And it's chiefly written in Go. Originally, it was in Java, so it was a little bit of a chubby footprint. Most of it's moved to Go. There are pros and cons of having used Go. We don't quite get the plugin architecture that we were used to with Java, you know, the plug and play kind of thing. The JVM, you know, does its class loader thing and loads the classes you need when you need it. Lost some of that with the Go, but the footprint is much, much smaller. There's one component still in Java, which is our rules engine. It hasn't yet reached the priority level, like, hey, we need to replace this with something else. So it's Java-based, it's rules right now. There are a few services that are in C. It's cloud native. It's all microservice based, so we can drop in new microservices. We can package maybe a machine learning model and drop it in there in a pipeline, et cetera. So it's very, very modular in that sense, cloud native in that sense. It's event driven because as some sensor data arrives in it, you know, it triggers certain actions. This is temperature above 100, do something, the pressure is about something, turn on a valve, close, open something, etc. But what is it not? Now, it's not an orchestrator. So it would fit in with another orchestrator, something like K3S. That's the talk I just attended, something like that I could work with or it could just be one central cloud you know, level manager saying launch the software on a certain node or a collection of nodes. It isn't a management plane. So there will be some other central brain that will say do something, load something, et cetera. It has no opinion about the hardware it runs on. It will run on a Raspberry Pi, 64 bit right now. It will run on you know, x86 you know, from any vendor type of stuff. It's not operating system opinionated either. Currently, we're using Ubuntu, but anything could go. It's not a problem. We just have to work on it and test that it works. So this is the picture of EdgeX that we'll spend a few extra minutes on. And it kind of captures what EdgeX really is. As I mentioned, it's an infrastructure. It's a, you know, one time we said, when we're getting into this IoT space, Let's develop a little IoT app and see what it takes. You know, you have to have some kind of southbound protocol support, you know, whether it's serial bus, USB, RESTful API, whatever, some sensor data is to enter. You process it, you might save it, and then you might export it somewhere. But always you can't assume you're gonna have network connectivity. And we were thinking about this from the automotive space. Let's not even worry about self-driving cars. What are the different kind of automotive applications we could have had there? We might want to have an insurance application. Was I driving too fast? Was I you know, hitting the brakes too hard? I mean, those will result in different kind of wear and tear patterns on the car. You know, if you keep hitting those brakes often, those brake pads will erode away. If you're going to accelerate and speed a lot and do something else, your insurance rates go up. But if you're idling somewhere, not only are you just wasting fuel, but it's also indicative for a smart city that maybe you have to adjust those traffic lights, maybe you have to build another lane, maybe you have to kind of give some incentive to people to do some kind of shift in their work hours, whatever. So there's a lot of data you can pull out of a car and the way people are driving it without even worrying about autonomous driving. So, but that problem triggered a lot of other thought processes. What speeding? Am I on that service road next to the highway? Am I on the highway? You know, that makes a difference. Do I get that GPS coordinates and map that to the speed limits in real time? It's not necessary for this sort of thing. It can be just collected, stored, and processed later. Likewise, do I want to have a separate network connection in the car for this sort of data? It's not real time. It, you know, that I have to change some behavior based on that. It's perfectly fine to store it process it and pump it up to maybe that insurance endpoint or my driving concur kind of application that wants to track how many miles I've driven or to a smart city app offline when the car's sitting in the garage. So there was like many thoughts like that that prompt us to say, hey, you know, do I need a data persistence layer? Do I need a data persistence layer that is as simple as a file system? And if so, how much space do I have on the system? Do I consolidate and make some higher level aggregate kind of information. Like if I'm driving at 60 miles an hour and let's say that's 15 miles over the speed limit, 
I don't really need to track that it was, you know, what it was at every second. I can consolidate and said, you know, Malni's speeding from two to three, and she was driving at 60 miles an hour, so you can collapse that information and kind of control this data dilutes kind of situation. So all those sort of processes that went through our head when we were thinking about an IoT application, we want to be able to support in a framework. So multiple ways of saving, multiple you know, ways to look at the data and trigger certain actions. So that's where a rules engine is useful. Then some notification alerts. Not always are we going to be like going to a cloud, but you still might want to notify this driver saying, hey, you're really speeding out here, beep, 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 or do something else. Or in a factory scenario, some pressure or temperature has gone too high. So there's a notification component in there. Then everything you do, you want to be able to log for audit purposes, for tracing, debugging, et cetera, et cetera. So edgex is a framework to help you build those iot applications and what will that end deployment on an edge node look like there will be the framework and then there will be the application software the application software would also just be microservices over here so with that we're getting to the point about where is this code how many of you have used edgex one one hand, okay, I hope a few more join and get on board later, okay? So thank you for using Edgex. <laughs> so the code's available on GitHub. We have a good wiki, and th this was also mentioned in a keynote this morning about you know summer of docs. Getting on board Edgex initially, there's a lot of recordings, but you know it takes a lot of time to go through a recording. One hour meeting, not all of it is useful. Even my 35 minute talk, not all of it is gonna be useful. There are a few nuggets that are useful. So it was important that we started building more documentation, writing the salient important things instead of expecting people to listen to a one hour talk for each little subcomponent. So our wiki has improved significantly. The documentation has improved significantly. We have a Slack channel with a lot of friendly people ready to answer your questions. And it's a total open source project with most decisions, maybe all decisions and all arguments and pros and cons, all of them coming up in our work group meetings. So we have weekly meetings for each of the subcomponents, like uh, the system management agent, the core services, the the device services. So they all have their own work group meetings and then there's a weekly technical steering committee meeting. And you know that's some of our developers who've made contributions. Ah, our lone person's picture is not here. And there's Jim White too, but that's where our code lies. And some of it has been archived and I'm just showing you the go ones. So let's look what this edgex 1.0 is and how long it took to get here. Well, it started back in 2017 and another thing mentioned in a keynote today and at other talks in the same room is there's a big difference between a proof of concept and a product. And all of that is here in edgex. So there was an initial proof of concept way back 2017 called Barcelona, then came California and there's no real pattern in this other than they start letters of the alphabet, okay? Next came Delhi, and this 1.0 version is called Edinburgh. It stems from the fact that we met in Edinburgh about a year back when we were nailing down the features of this release. And I just briefly mention here a few things, the blue box, but we'll get into more details. So edgex Foundry 1.0 with our beautiful purple octopus. And now we get into the details. It's got enhancements in a component called the system management agent. This component will let you, uh, through it's, it's all API, REST API calls, you can say, hey, how much CPU am I using? Is there enough resources here to meet all my workload requirements? Am I at like 90%, 100% pegged? Is something else going on? And that's also useful for anomaly detection. If something weird is happening, some workload's doing something odd, consuming excess resources, denial of service. So we're collecting metrics and we can pump it out to some management plane, whatever your favorite management plane. It could be Amazon's uh, you know, AWS IoT or Azure or even VMware's Pulse IoT Center. 
It also allows you to check the status of all the different services. Like we mentioned, there's a registry service that I didn't quite mention. There's a notification service, a logging service. So are each of these services up and about and ready to do their business? Do I need to restart them? So the system management agent allows you to do that kind of you know, visibility into the system. We introduced a correlation identifier, which helps you to trace end-to-end -end what's happening as the sensor data arrive. Let's say it's some camera input or a light bulb input. How did it go through the whole stack? You know, it came in, it landed in the core data, it got saved into maybe the database, it triggered some rules engine action. So that was an important thing. And most, at least when I worked in OpenStack too, that wasn't something that they thought of first, and I wonder why. But that's a very, very important thing. We've increased the number of unit tests, and that can be a plus and a negative. There's some people get so excited about unit tests, they write it for the most trivial things. But a lot more unit tests have been introduced. There are now more black box tests. And one other important thing is, we've got black box testing now for the devices, for the core data, but we want to increase it to the other components. And that's all going to be part of the next release. We have a new performance test framework in place, and we have you know, Linux Foundation resources to test these things, which is nice. We have made some improvements to the microservices. Now, what do I mean by improvement to microservices? These are going to be running sometimes on very constrained devices. Sometimes they might be on beefy devices. It's fine, then you can do anything in waste resources. No, we still want to be you know, using things optimally. And one of the initial ways this was coded was a lot of data was being transferred between microservices. And we had a similar comment earlier today in the AI talk. Do you want to keep all the little components in your pipeline in a single container or you know, across containers? And their inefficiencies pros, cons, modular, not modular. But when you're going to cross microservices, you've lost that power, that joy that shared memory gave you, that you could have just you know, used a reference and gotten everything you wanted. Things now have to either be an ID that you go to a database and retrieve, or you have to send it all down that pipe you know, in your JSON or whatever, or your gRPC. And it has to be like dehydrated and rehydrated to make an object. So there have been some inefficiencies there in the initial design, which we're improving and working on, but we cannot mess with the API and all because we're now at 1.0. We have to be respectful of that. So we're trying to do things keeping that API fixed. We also upgraded to Go 1.11, and now we're using Go modules. What else did we do in the HX 1.0 release? We have beefed up the device SDK. Now, why is this device SDK important? You know, software development kit. It's important because we are not anticipating or thinking of every different device that somebody will imagine up and want to use in the IoT space. It could be a heart monitor. It could be a diabetes, you know, sugar monitor. It could be um, your heart rate. It, just about anything. And you know, your happy little light bulb. Is it on off? Is your wind turbine doing something, what else is it transmitting? And those are some very complex systems. So the SDK lets you create those device profiles. And once you've created them, you just launch it as a device service. And every field it transmits, it's part of that profile. And then the type of that value, is it a string? Is it a Boolean? Is it a 64-bit integer, whatever? All that sort of stuff you get to specify in your device SDK. And eventually, the commands, what can I do? Do I get to turn on off that light bulb? Do I have to maybe give somebody a little shock to get their heartbeats in sync? So that's where the commands come in. And then we have introduced, and this is really like 0.1 version, the application SDK. Now, that was at the device side, but what do you do higher up in the stack? You might want to process this data differently. If it's heartbeat data, something. If it's blood sugar data, something else. But that's in the space of the application. The domain knowledge comes from those people who create these sort of applications, not as EdgeX framework people. So we want to make it easy enough to introduce a pipeline, drop in a different machine learning model, maybe do some other kind of smoothing alerting, whatever, so that piece will fall into the application SDK. And I think that's a very, very important piece, and that's maturing in this next upcoming release. 
Another thing with any open source project is you shouldn't be opinionated. You should be al inclusive in allowing different products to be dropped in and used. But what does that mean? You need another layer of abstraction. You say, I want data persistence, and you should have commands. But underlying that, how does it get saved? Do you use a Redis database? Do you use a MongoDB database? Or like that simple automotive application for insurance that I was talking about? Maybe you don't even want data persistence and triple copy, et cetera. Maybe the file system is enough. Or maybe you just want to pass through data. So part of this Edinburgh release was he started offering different layers, uh, you know, options for persistence. So with all things open source, great, you can look at the code. But is that what anybody wants to do and they want to just take it for a test drive? Use it. See if it makes sense for them. You know, figure out its pluses and minuses. No, they, they really want some documentation. How do I launch it? Is there some Docker Compose file that I can just say, run, and then you know it pulls the right images and launches it? Are there tutorials? Is there a dev kit? And yes, you can run EdgeX on a dev kit from there or you know, buy your own Raspberry Pi for about $35, $40 and get going. And definitely you can run it in a VM, which is what we did initially. You can run it on your laptop, you know, with all the container engine that you have there, and life is good. So we've done a lot more, you know, support in there to onboard new users. So that's a big, big invitation. Please come and use it. It's, it's really friendly, and if you find an issue and say, hey, your documentation sucks, please drop an issue and we'll fix it. We really wanted to get stronger, better, and be more used. Another very important thing is we've introduced a lot more sample device services. So Alex, who's in front, who you know put his hand up saying he used EdgeX, he contributed a GPS device service. This was born from our work when we were doing that automotive insurance application. And we said, well, now that we know about EdgeX and that it has all the framework requirements we need, and we adopted this as the project we're going to work on, we said, hey, let's put in a GPS device. Then we wanted to put an OBD device, and that's going to come later. But it also has some random devices. It has an SNMP one for network devices. So a bunch of things. And you can start using the device simple as your template. OK, so what are all the different southbound protocols? That's one of the advantages of you know, leveraging EdgeX. You don't want to be building all the different protocols yourself. That's the power of community. So we have BACnet support in there. That's the one used typically for building automation. There's Modbus, which is used by the inter industrial internet of things. There's BLE, and there's MQTT. So most, most IoT systems have MQTT. That's been around for four or five years, a lightweight messaging system. But the other two were very important to break our way and path into the industrial space and the housing space. Another very important thing that came up with the 1.0 release is support for binary data. It's all fine if you're just talking about temperature and pressure and you know a real number, 64 bits, whatever. But when you're talking about video data or high definition camera data, that's a lot of data. And this was contributed by Intel. So I must call out, it's not just us VMware with our team, but there's a lot of input from Dell. There's a lot of input from Intel. And you know, the industry is coming together to make this happen. Not only the gateway vendors, camera vendors, hardware vendors, but we're trying to make this something that anybody and everybody can adopt easily. And I think Seaboard data support was to help make all this image and video data support possible without you know, busting all your resources and making that serial line, et cetera, work. So last but not least, you know, all of IoT can have mud on it if it isn't secure. And 1.0 really started talking and getting a little more serious about security. It wasn't just about some functionality and, hey, I got my you know, light bulb to talk and I turned it off type of thing. But we've started really addressing security. There was a talk yesterday by Ting Yu Zeng from Dell, who's done a lot of the threat modeling. And he had a talk which covered all the things that are there today and coming up. We've essentially used the stride threat model. We're leveraging proven patterns for security, like you know, have a, a secure gateway. Don't let all the REST API endpoints be visible to the outside world for people to poke and prod. Like you don't want some 
somebody coming and touching the system management agent and saying, hey, services restart, or poking into the database and pulling out data. So we have a gateway, and behind that, it's like a reverse proxy. All the other services are there behind it. So that's in place already with Edinburgh. Today, we have just one certificate for that gateway and then one for the secret store. But tomorrow, in the Fuji release, the next the F release, we'll have different certificates for each of the services, and they'll have their own private channel for communicating with the secret store and outside. Then the um, secret store today, it, it has an encryption key, but we want to beef that up further with a hardware layer for security under it, something like a TPM-based solution. So that's our plan, and this is where we are today with EdgeX security. We do have a security gateway. We have a single set of keys and certificate for the main gateway, and then we are looking at the threat model and trying to make it much stronger. So to summarize security today, secure communications, PKI, secret store. This uses HashiCorp Vault. It also uses HashiCorp uh, Kong for the gateway. Uh, we have created, because it's our 1.0 release, a security incident response you know, process. We have a small team of people, so it's on need-to-know basis, you know, like Mission Impossible. If you know it, you better know it because you have a reason to know it. And then we will uh, triage it, like any hospital type of thing, see whether we can resolve it, whether we can mitigate it and document it and publish it as necessary. Uh, what else can I say about it? So that's a private email. Only a few people get to see it, and it's really controlled. And we'll be responsible with our disclosures. So this brings us to what's next. Uh, October 7th to 8th, we have a hackathon. Uh, Henry Lau might be somewhere around, and I said, hey, you know, you should say, how about a $10,000 prize or something? He didn't say the prize money. But we're inviting users of IoT or anybody who's eager to try it out to you know, apply it to a real world problem. Is it retail? Is it healthcare or something? And see how it can meet their needs. And in the process, we also learn, like, what did we miss? What else should we build? Because you can't imagine everything. Uh, November 4th to 7th, and I hope some of you will decide to adopt EdgeX and come. Uh, everyone's welcome. We have a face-to-face -face where we will decide the next features, the G-release features. Prior to that, by the end of October or early November, maybe around the time of that face-to-face, -face, we hope to release our Fuji uh, version. And I mentioned earlier, we have our weekly meetings. Now I'm going to give you a little peek of what's coming in Fuji. I already hinted, there are going to be security enhancements. Today's secrets, if you have 10 services over there, actually there are 12, they can see each other's secrets. So it's like a trusted cabal of services. But when we want to go more secure, they're going to have their own secrets, their own public-private key pair certificates, so that's the plan. And uh, as you launch the system, they'll get their own keys, or you can import those keys. Alex over here is working on a command line interface for EdgeX. Uh, it was born of his own frustration when he was building the GPS uh, device services. Oh my God, I have to have all these curl commands. I have to maybe keep them in a script and execute them. And most of the developers had gotten used to doing that. And they said, oh, you know, I don't need it. But then once he started pitching, he said, oh yeah, we need it. We want it. And this is so awesome. So when he demoed it, there was a lot of positive feedback. And that's coming up soon. Fuji release. We'll be building cloud connectors to some of the well-known clouds, and uh, you know Alibaba too, maybe in for the China market. So we have plans for AWS, Azure, and VMware Pulse IoT Center. Uh, now there's a certification group. So is this going to meet our API? Somebody's deployment or someone's reference implementation, be it on a Raspberry Pi with X Y Z amount of RAM or whatever. So there'll be a certification process. Uh, we're going to introduce more manageability to the APIs. One of my special interests is to be able to update the software on an edge device. I mean, we've seen there's Spectre, there's Meltdown, there's a new Go module security uh, you know, CVE. I might need to update my edge nodes. And that's one of the places where you can have the major attack. That's why you know, IoT is hard, because of the threat surface. And so I would like to see in those APIs one for 
you know, updating the software on my edge, not just the application software. Mentioned earlier, a leaner, meaner inter-microservice communication you know, solution. Also mentioned earlier, a richer application pipeline, more black box testing, 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 always good, and definitely performance testing. So I'd like to call out that tomorrow, my colleague Alex has a talk. It's, he's gonna be running edgex on a Raspberry Pi, and he calls it as easy as Pi. There were some not so easy moments and the pie was burning in the oven type of stuff. Oh, and I have it as Frasberry pie, okay. <laughs> anyway, so tomorrow his talk is there. Please come, he's an excellent speaker and he'll give you a good demo of EdgeX2 and his CLI. His CLI lets you even do meta level commands like dumping the database, seeing what's in there, etc. And yesterday, Tingyu uh, Zeng from Dell spoke about security in EdgeX, and his slides and his talk will also be available, so please take a look so you feel more comfortable about using the system. And with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you.